Hello, everyone. Welcome to our discussion today about tech, crypto, and the world of decentralized finance. You've heard a lot of discussion in the last few days on these topics, but now we will concentrate on how they really intersect with one another. That includes the evolving crypto ecosystem and regulatory initiatives currently underway, technology underpinning crypto and different use cases, and the outlook for decentralized finance, including the risk and opportunities it presents. We are very pleased to have an especially distinguished panel to engage with us today. Hester Pierce, Commissioner of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Steve Kokonos, who is CEO of Algorand, an open source software technology company. And Tim Assad, former chairman of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, Commission and currently a research fellow at Harvard and an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University. I'm Patricia Haas Cleveland, U.S. President of AMFA. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder that today's conversation is on the record and we welcome questions after initial remarks, so please enter them in the chat box. Just to quickly start and set the stage, uh, for those who are following the markets, you know it's a very busy day. Uh, but if we just take a step back, I think we can say that despite the turn down in prices and continued volatility in the crypto market, interest in digital assets has really only increased and attracted mainstream players. In the US alone, recent headlines have included Fidelity, offering the opportunity for 401 plan, retirement plans to offer a Bitcoin investment. Goldman Sachs is offering loans with Bitcoin as collateral and has done the first OTC crypto transaction. BlackRock has launched a blockchain focused ETF. Visa and MasterCard are linking their credit and debit cards to crypto brokerages and PayPal and Block are incorporating crypto even more so into their apps. Yet despite this growing adoption by mainstream, the real spotlight has been on regulation, or as many have said earlier uh, in, the, in the course of these conversations, the lack of regulatory clarity. And this has been especially true in the United States. Um, particularly, the spotlight has been on stablecoin, um, all, all the more today, given what's, what's going on. Uh, we already heard last week that US lawmakers were saying if we didn't have regulation out on this $180 billion market, investors would get hurt. Uh, Fitch agent, Rating Agency has been warning about potential implications on the short-term credit markets. Uh, and today we've seen a lot um, in that sector. So a lot of folks have been saying, and I and this is interesting, it came out even today in the in the news that maybe this incident right now, this volatility we're seeing today, will prompt, in fact, regulators to move on the stable coin front. Um, at the same time, others have said that lack of regulation has also, or lack of regulatory clarity has also pushed innovation offshore. So there's a, a big backdrop to our conversation today. Um, Having said that, there are in fact a lot of regulatory initiatives underway, or at least a number of them. We have uh, the Fed board, as everyone knows, is uh, completing, uh, closing its comment period next week on a paper to consider the merits of a digital dollar issued by the central bank. Uh, the treasury is undertaking a review and is working with Congress, in fact, on stable coin regulations and, and possible initiatives there. And the White House recently issued an executive order requiring the US regulatory agencies to come together with a regulatory framework proposal by the fall. Separately, the SEC Chair Gary Gensler proposed regulation, um, also open for comment. I believe that period has shut, but to potentially regulate crypto platforms, which has drawn much attention. And Congress has actually introduced a bill to give the CFTC uh, a greater role in overseeing crypto. So an awful lot going on. Um, Commissioner Pierce, we won't ask you to tell us how it's gonna end, but I think if you could shed any light on what's happening, it would be great for our audience because there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding and lack of understanding of what's happening in the regulatory space. Well, thank you, Patricia, and thanks to OMFIF. I'm delighted to be part of this panel. Uh, I do have to start with my disclaimer, which is that my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. And I guess the second disclaimer is that I certainly can't predict how this will all turn out. Um, there is certainly a lot of interest in crypto. I've been at the SEC now for as a commissioner for four years, uh, a little over four years. And throughout that time, um, 
there has been growing interest in in crypto matters, and I think um, of late it's really picked up quite a bit in Washington. And as a result, you're seeing a lot of different regulators wanting to get a piece of the regulatory action, and everyone is testing out different theories for why uh, why their particular agency should be the one to to run the regulatory show on crypto. I think it is important for us to be thinking um, at this stage carefully about, about who should have authority over which piece. But I also think it's important for us really to move forward. So far uh, at the SEC, our approach has been led by enforcement as opposed to really clearly thinking about how regulation should apply and, and what, what we can do on the regulatory front. Um, and, and so we'll see whether now that's going to shift a little bit. I, I hope I keep remaining hopeful that we will take a proactive uh, approach. And I would hope that we could do it in conjunction with the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, our partner regulator, um, the, the, the one that uh, Chair, Chairman um, Massad was, was formerly the, the head of, I hope that we can together uh, work on a regulatory structure, or at least thinking about what the problems are here and how we might approach them. Meanwhile, Congress is, is thinking about regulation in this space. There have been a number of, uh, of bills introduced around digital assets, both in the House and on the Senate side as well. I think um, one, one place which you mentioned, Patricia, we might see some Movement is around stable coins. That's an area that obviously this week has gotten a lot of attention, but I think more generally, um, it's been one area within crypto that's, that's really had quite a, a moment. And there's a lot, of, a lot of use of stable coins and therefore people are thinking down the road of if this gets even bigger, do we wanna have a regulatory, some kind of a regulatory framework uh, some people have suggested that should be at the SEC. Other people want it to be the banking regulators. And, um, and so there are different, different potential options for, for approaching stable coins. As with anything in crypto, I think it's very important to remember that one term can cover a lot of different types of, of assets. So you might say stable coin and one stable coin might look nothing like another stable coin. So I think it is very important to approach all of the conversations in, in crypto with an understanding that there's um, there's a lot of variation. And, and so that also makes it difficult to craft a regulatory framework because you're trying not only to cover what exists today, which is very varied, but you're trying to think down the road of what, what is going to exist tomorrow. And, and, and that's not easy to do. So I think what I've urged us to do at the SEC is to use our regulatory tools that we have, which allow us to um, provide exemptions from our existing rules that are tailored to a particular um, technology. And so we could be doing that and that would allow for iteration and experimentation, which I think is, is really important at the, at the outset of any technology. Um, and with experimentation, I should just say, Come, we need to allow room for there to be failure as well, because that obviously is part of, of trying new things out. And our framework really does allow for that kind of trial and error. And I hope that we will, um, that we will use it for that purpose. And I guess in the US, it's particularly challenging, not only because there's so much activity already in the space, and to your point, it is very important indeed to differentiate between the different digital asset classes. Uh, stable coins is one subset of crypto, and then within stable coins, not all of them are the same, as you said. Um, but given that we have already uh, a relatively fragmented regulatory system, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that if you're trying to address a new area, a new field, it can be overlapping and it can be complicated. Some folks have said maybe there should be a new regulatory agency, a new regulator. Others have said, and you've sort of implied this, that there is existing authority within a current setup and structure, if you work together, that you could in fact design a regulatory framework to address some of these issues. Are, do you have a view one way or the other, or perhaps that's that's not a fair question, but I'm just pointing, you know, throwing out there that some have talked about the need potentially for a new regulatory uh, agency. 
Yeah, that is something that a lot of people are talking about. And I think it's ultimately Congress's call of how they want to regulate the space. One, one caution I have is that when you try to set up a regulator for crypto, one, you add another regulator to the already, as you mentioned, quite crowded field of regulators in, in Washington. Uh, and, and second, if crypto really is going to be married to the traditional financial system, which some people in crypto may not want, but I suspect over time that you'll see crypto distributed ledger technology working its way into the traditional financial system. And so it's a little bit hard to peel crypto off and put it in a separate box and say, we're going to regulate this separately because ultimately those two worlds will intersect with one another. And then how do you handle that as a regulator? It, it's, it's really very difficult to, um, I think, to, to cabinet off in its, its own separate place. Maybe it's easier to do that now, but I think in, in 10 years from now, we might look back and say, oh no, um, now how are we going to mesh those two things? That said, I think the impetus behind wanting a special crypto regulator, the, there are really two reasons. Um, one is that the existing regulators have really kind of made a mess of things. I think given that, and speaking for my own agency, I think we haven't taken the leadership position we could in, in developing a reasonable regulatory framework, which has made it much more difficult to innovate um, and, and much more difficult for people to distinguish the good actors from the bad actors because we don't have a regulatory framework in place. So we've made a mess of it. And, and second, the, the, if you created a crypto specific regulator, you would have a lot of institutional expertise in that regulator. And you would also have probably the ability to be more, um, more, more able to adapt as the technology was changing. You'd be more flexible potentially particularly if you crafted it as a self-regulatory organization, perhaps you could be um, more flexible. And, and, and that is something that I think a lot of people are looking to, and that, that's one reason people want a, um, a separate crypto regulator. Right. And just a question, kind of as a regulator, uh, what do you think are some of the key issues and the key risks that a regulatory framework should address. And I, I know there's a big focus on both um, investor protection. There's also concern about financial stability uh, as we move towards decentralization of finance. But what, what are sort of the key issues that you think need to be included in a regulatory framework? Well, I think that is what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to protect investors or purchasers of these assets um, in the sense of getting them the information that they need to make their own decisions about what, whether they wanna buy these assets. Um, so that's one piece of it and, and making sure that they understand the risks of what they're, what they're buying. Uh, another piece is the financial stability piece. From the SEC's perspective, I mean, one area we get a lot of questions on is, is when is something being sold as part of, of a securities offering? And if something, if a token is sold as part of a securities offering, do the securities laws follow it around for the rest of its, its life? Um, and if that's the case, then we're, we have to make some adjustments for how the securities laws apply. Um, there are a lot of questions around, for us, I think around custody uh, and around how, how financial institutions can interact with, uh, with digital assets, with crypto. Um, and then another area where I think we, we could really be uh, working on a framework is trying to think about how will, as I mentioned, I think traditional finance and crypto are going to intersect quite a bit with one another. And so how can we work with the industry as they're thinking about experimenting with this technology um, to allow those experiments to happen, which may require some adjustments of the way our, our rules apply? Well, I'm sure the industry really welcomes uh, that concept and that approach to sort of work together to get their thoughts too. I wanna to go back to a question you mentioned about um, innovation and the importance of allowing for failures, but basically creating a space so that you can innovate. And if we look at Europe, and I'm not saying to use that as an example, but in, in the EU, they obviously have proposed uh, markets and crypto assets, Mika, they, whether that's 
it's in its final stage or whether it's right or it's wrong in the direction it's going, it's out there. They hope to have it in place by uh, 2024, as I understand it. So I think some private sector folks are saying at least there will be some regulatory clarity we can we can work with one way or the other. Um, at the ECB, Christine Lagarde has obviously encouraged accelerating the launch of a digital dollar. So you are seeing efforts in other jurisdictions to go ahead and to provide clarity one way or the other around a lot of the digital asset space. Do you feel the lack of this, uh, the U.S. kind of lagging behind? And I, I know Chairman Powell has said he'd rather get it right than get it fast. Um, but do you worry that some of this lack of um Clarity is pushing innovation offshore and encouraging our innovators to go to other jurisdictions where there may be more clarity? I do worry about that. I think it's important for us to have a good regulatory framework and that makes our jurisdiction more attractive. That's certainly been the case with our capital markets. They're well regulated. The, the regulations are predictable and, and, and sound by and large. Um, and, and so because of that, framework that it's made people um, want to be part of our markets because they 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 feel that they can operate um, safely within those markets and we could do the same thing around crypto now the counterpoint to that is that when you try to develop a regulatory framework very early in in the adoption of a new technology you may get it wrong and you may end up putting a very inflexible structure in place that that doesn't actually go where the technology is going. So that's something to bear in mind too, but I think that's all the more reason to try to build um, a framework that does allow for this iteration for this, for this trial and error so that you, you, you can early on you know, allow people to, to do what they think early on is, 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 is where the technology is going. But then as the technology changes, your, your regulation, your exemptions can change with it. So Yes, if we could put a flexible, adaptable regulatory framework in place now, I think we would we would help to avoid the problem that I'm seeing, which is people saying, I don't want to do stuff in the United States and I don't want to have U.S. persons involved at all in my project because it could result in an enforcement action. That's just not a good way um, to do things. We, we should be the place where everyone wants to come to do innovation. And I'm sure that's a very welcome view. I do want to come back to you later about, you know, maybe what a regulatory framework might look like. Um, and also, I think it's very important that whatever we do, obviously, we have to, when I say we, sorry, in the U.S. as an American, um, it not only has to sort of address U.S. needs, but we have to think very much about how will this work globally. So the conversation with other regulators in terms of how do different national approaches to regulation um, complement each other and, and work together. But let me come back to that later and, and move on now. I kind of want to turn to the technology side of, of things. Um, and with Steve, maybe we can talk a little bit about blockchain that underpins much of the digital ac ac assets activity, certainly crypto. We know that the bedrock of crypto is blockchain technology uh, and blockchain is expected to be at the heart of decentralized finance, but blockchain is also used for many things. Um, Algorand describes itself as an open source software company building technical innovation. In your mission statement, you talk about global trust through decentralization, designs that drive adoption by billions and technology that eliminates barriers to prosperity for all. So those are wonderful values. And it'd be great to hear from you how sort of examples of how technology can achieve this and maybe some use cases for blockchain. Sure, well, um, first, thanks for having me, Patricia, appreciate it. And, um, you know, I, I think if I take a step back um, from, you know, uh, some of the things you've been talking about, I think there is a distinction between um, cryptocurrencies and tokens that people hold. And I think broadly, if you look at the world, there's maybe a couple hundred million people that that um, hold cryptocurrency, whether it's it's Bitcoin or other currencies. Um, but there's also blockchain technology. Um, and we see public blockchain networks as, you know, the next major public utility uh, that, that people will use every day. And I think if you go back 20 years ago, um, people would have had the same questions about the internet, whether, you know, what people would use it for and why you would need to shop online. And um, even this call that we're on right now, I, I think is probably something that, that um, early people would have 
um, seen, but but maybe wasn't seen by everyone. And so I, I think what we're starting to find is is that um, two things. One, you know, certainly I think the early blockchain technologies and networks um, are you know were slow. Also, definitely there was a lot of issues with energy consumption, and I think especially we see in um, certain parts of of um, you know, certain types of markets, uh, you know, people are, are very concerned about that. Um, we are as well. Um, I think what now is happening is there's next generation technologies that um, uh, that really solve sort of the energy con consumption and efficiency problems. And I think we're starting to see, um, you know, some really interesting uses of decentralized networks, um, I think really beyond kind of a, a pure financial use case. Um, and we're seeing that adopted by countries, by, um, you know, people around the world. And I think what's fascinating about kind of this space is that sort of the intersection of, of blockchain uh, and crypto is really that, um, you know, there's now ways to economically incent um, communities and to understand kind of what that that value is. Um, but I think largely what we're seeing is there's a lot of value placed also on transparency and on being able to trust kind of what results are. And, and I think there's many um, increasingly higher scale applications that the people are deploying that take advantage of this algorithmic trust that um, public blockchain networks create. Yeah, you actually jumped right ahead to something I was going to ask you because it is true when the internet came about, nobody really had the imagination uh, to say, wow, what could this lead to and how can this change the, the world as, as we know it? Um, and yet you had all these stepping stones leading up to it. You, you, you had the computer, you had transistors, you had the microchip, you know, the next thing you knew, you, the, the internet just took off. Do you think blockchain and this sort of decentralized technology will in fact be a stepping stone to just a whole different world going forward that we really can't imagine right now? And I guess, especially in terms of the financial world. Well, I think if you if you just sort of look at what public blockchain networks represent from a, a financial perspective, um, you know, for the majority of, of human history, I, I think financial innovation has happened um, in uh, you know private settings. And I think now over the past few years, what we've seen is a lot of experimentation in an open public setting, and I think that's leading to a, a pace of innovation um, that's uh, that's you know dramatically quicker than than um, has probably been seen before, and also new concepts that that haven't been seen before. And so I think over time. Um, definitely, you know, some of those ideas will, will permeate into the mainstream and be used by people every day. I, I think it is sort of factually the case that that um, using blockchain networks today is, you know, sort of technically difficult. Uh, and I think that, you know, as a new technology, it doesn't necessarily have the maturity from a user experience perspective that, um, you know, kind of the, the applications we use every day, like the Facebooks and Netflixes of the world, um, where, you know, very seamless experiences and, and um, separating the end users from the back end technology is something that um, uh, has really evolved over the past, uh, past couple of decades. But I think if, if your question is, you know, will, will sort of blockchain networks be something that, that everybody uses um, every day. Um, we certainly think that that's, that's the case for sure. Um, and um, also, you know, certainly uh, agree with Commissioner Pierce that, uh, that, you know, we think that the traditional and sort of decentralized mm -hmm. financial systems are going to increasingly intersect um, more over time as, as people use these tools more. And your point about just um, how things have changed just even in recent years, if you just look at some of the developments we've seen geopolitically in, in just the last few months even, um, we've seen you know humanitarian aid for Ukraine going through crypto, we've seen sanctions affecting the uh, financial system. So there's been a lot of changes just from a geopolitical perspective where alternative ideas and mechanisms have, have emerged. And I guess that says that you don't really know how this is gonna play out in the future, but it's sort of once the train's out of the station, it's it's probably gonna take off. I wanna just go back to one point that um, Commissioner Pierce mentioned, which is some of the challenges that, and, and the risks both to investors and, and the system as a whole that keeps regulators up at night. I mean, do you think technology can be used to address some of these things? Can we find some solutions? Um, from a technology perspective to handle some of these concerns or to, to, to help mitigate risk in these areas? Well, I think risk is a, you know, important thing to, to consider, certainly. Um, I think if you take a step back, um, when people transact on, uh, you know, blockchain networks, what they're really 
uh, doing is shifting counterparty risk or what they really need to understand, I guess I should say, is that counterparty risk is different um, because now you're trusting algorithms, you're trusting in kind of code and technology um, versus, you know, if you look at the financial system in, in America, at least the traditional one, it's a very well-regulated system. People can, people understand kind of what the relative risk is when they go to the bank. Um, and so I, I think as, as people use new tools, um, it is sort of a, a fundamentally um, different paradigm. And, and I'm not sure that, that that's necessarily um, well understood. I think it also means that people need certainly to do due diligence on what technologies they're using on, you know, the sort of relative quality of the applications that they're, they're using and understand um, some of those elements. Now, um, other ways uh, that technology can be used to, to sort of help assess that, I, you know, I do think that's the case. Um, I think one thing that's a, a sort of big topic in decentralized applications today are um, code audits and, and helping people understand, you know, what those risks are in kind of a, a simpler way. Right now, that's a very esoteric um, I'd say discipline and making that simpler and um, also having, you know, even potentially automated markets to ensure against risk is, is something that um, I think we'll see start to develop over time. So I think it's, it's sort of twofold. One, early participants certainly need to understand, um, you know, what the technology risks are and, and how they're transacting. I think over time, um, definitely the technology will evolve in a way that it, it um, you know, helps at least helps reduce risk for, for people um, around some of those areas. That's great to hear. Great, let's move on to um, Tim. I wanna say, so what does this mean? You have uh, blockchain, you have digital assets. To, Heather, to Hester's point, you have uh, the traditional world meeting the decentralized world. Uh, you are particularly well positioned to talk about this because not only were you a former regulator at the, as chairman of the CFTC, but you were also an assistant secretary at the Treasury for Financial Stability. So you were in charge, I guess, of picking up some of the pieces of 2008. Um, we know DeFi is very much growing. I think the BIS, or maybe it was the Financial Stability uh, Board, did a report and said the total value of digital assets locked in DeFi transactions is approximately 100 billion. Uh, at the end of last year. Now that may not sound like a big number, but it's up four times from the year prior. So it's definitely growing. And in their report that they issued in February, the Financial Stability Board, they indeed noted um, without sufficient regulations and market oversight, DeFi platforms could pose risks to financial stability. So we've gone from a lot of focus about investor uh, and consumer concern and protection to risk to the financial system. Um, however, people think DeFi will be a turning point. Uh, it'll improve the efficiency of the financial system, replacing time-consuming and costly human transactions with and traditional processes with automation. And I suppose just to back up, and I'll, I'll ask you for your own definition, but at the most basic level, I suppose DeFi allows users to trade, borrow, lend digital assets without having to go through an intermediary, which means you don't have, you bypass banks uh, and all the traditional roles that they perform, whether it's custodial, record keeping, trading, and you bypass government. So it's definitely a, uh, a whole different way to look at finance. So is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Will the benefits outweigh the negatives? How do we think about DeFi? And maybe I should let you start with, you know, how do you look and think about DeFi sure. just to begin with? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say the concept is terrific. And as you know, I, you know, I spent five years at the treasury dealing with the wreckage of the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, you know, I've, I saw firsthand the damage that, um, you know, large institutions taking on excessive risk can cause. But we have to look at what is this new activity doing? And, you know, you've had a number of panels already at this, at this uh, symposium, which have made the point that, look, if it's the same activity, same risks, then it needs to be regulated in the same or a similar way. What we're seeing on DeFi today is a variety of, uh, autonomous software protocols providing for exchange platforms in lieu of centralized exchanges, providing for lending and borrowing, providing other sorts of financial processes. Now, so first you've got the issue that, well, if they're creating the same risk, we should regulate them in the same way. The other thing I think people don't talk enough about is that even though a lot of 
DeFi enthusiasts would say they are replacing traditional intermediaries. In fact, they're not performing all the functions of those intermediaries. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing KYC and AML and CFT, and you're not providing adequate investor disclosure, and you're not providing reporting, and you know, you're not doing the other things that we require centralized intermediaries or simply entities that perform these functions to do, then you're not capable of being a substitute. You're not a substitute for those traditional intermediaries. It's like me saying, oh, I can build a car that would get much better gas mileage than anything Ford or GM can produce because I'm not gonna put brakes in it. Now, obviously that doesn't work. And that's kind of the simplicity sometimes with which I think DeFi enthusiasts defend what's going on. Um, you know, you mentioned the uh, recent STC proposal, uh, which said nothing about crypto. It didn't even mention crypto, it was right. about uh, ATX. But a lot of people in the crypto community said, oh, gee, this could apply to DeFi platforms. We'd better uh, respond. Now, the fact is that proposal can't uh, increase the SEC's jurisdiction. Whether the SEC has jurisdiction over a DeFi platform depends on whether it's you know, dealing in securities. But if it is dealing in securities, then I would argue the SEC should uh, have, have jurisdiction. Now, I agree entirely with Commissioner Peirce, much better to regulate through regulations than it is through enforcement, much better for the SEC and the CFTC to get together and to try to arrive at common standards, because I think we, we can have common standards. But you know, we need to recognize that the DeFi world needs to be held uh, uh, to a higher standard than what we've seen uh, thus far. The, the challenge as you know, we had uh, uh, Ashley Alder on uh, early this morning, I actually managed to see that. Um, you know, he's noting that, look, there's a challenge with DeFi and that where's the regulatory nexus? Uh, how do we deal with cross border? Those are real issues, but we need to overcome those. What, you know, it was interesting on that ATS proposal, a lot of people in the crypto community responded and even some of them, some of the most well-known biggest players in the industry said, well, gee, the SEC hasn't even told us how its rules uh, are, uh, how we're supposed to meet its requirements if its requirements do apply to us. Well, now, since when is it the responsibility of the regulator to tell an innovator well, you know, we have these laws and uh, you've got to comply. It's not the responsibility of the regulator to figure out how exactly to do that. It is a responsibility of the regulator to make sure the application of those requirements are clear. But the DeFi community has to take on the responsibility of figuring out how it can meet the same standards we apply to centralized entities uh, if it's performing similar activities. It's as simple as that. Well, I'd be curious if there was a industry view uh, that said it's as simple as that. I, I don't know. You hear that they, they're they not sure what applies to them or they're not sure where they fit from a definitional perspective. Uh, I guess and, that's what a lot of them are struggling with. And, and to the extent there is a lack of clarity there, yes, that is the responsibility of regulators. And that's why I, I like Commissioner Peirce's suggestion that the SEC and the CFTC get together number one, because I think then you avoid some of this, you know, getting bogged down in which bucket does it go in. But the big problem in the regulatory jurisdiction area is a real one, which is that neither the SEC nor the CFTC has responsive, has authority to regulate the uh, distribution and trading of crypto assets, which are not securities in that cash market, right? The SEC can only regulate things if they're securities. The CFTC can regulate derivatives based on crypto assets that are commodities, but it doesn't have full authority to set standards for how that cash trading market should operate. And frankly, that's where a lot of the activity is, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a large part of the market. 
And we don't have a federal regulator with technically that power. You see that, for example, with um, Coinbase even. We don't even have to be talking about DeFi. We can talk about centralized exchanges. You know, we don't have a framework. Coinbase came out with disclosure this week that said, oh, you know, by the way, all of uh, your, the customer assets that we hold uh, might be deemed our assets in a bankruptcy, not customer assets. That's very different, right, than, than what happens with a broker dealer mm -hmm. um, uh, where we have, you know, SIPC protection and other things. And so, again, it just illustrates the point that, you know, a lot of people think, well, the only difference between a crypto exchange and a securities exchange is the asset that's being traded. No, that's not the only difference. The crypto exchanges aren't subject to a regulatory framework the same way our securities exchanges are. And therefore, the risk to investors and to society is greater. Commissioner Purse, you are smiling. I don't know if there's something you want to say, um, but I do go back to the point that you said, ideally, or maybe you didn't say this, I interpreted it, but the CFTC and the SEC and the CFTC and the other regulatory agencies should, should work together. Certainly what Tim said from his seat, that's probably how he approached it when he was CFTC head chair. Is, is this a non-starter in the current world or is it just all too complicated? Oh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's, it's something that even Chair Gensler, who does tend to see securities where, where maybe I don't always see securities, um, he, he suggested that we work together with the CFTC. I would like to see something concrete happen there. I mean, I think we could start in a very easy way by holding some joint public roundtables together. Um, we do have a history of both not working well together and working well together. So, uh, you know, we could take this as an opportunity to, to exhibit the working well together. Uh, I think that would be very valuable. Um, I, I will say that on the on the Reg ATS proposal, a couple comments. One, recently we reopened the comment period, so it, it there is a little more time for people to comment on that. Second, we did, um, you know, I have concerns about that proposal, not only from the perspective of how will it affect DeFi, but how will it affect lots of things, because we took quite a broad view of what an exchange type facility would be. We, we talk about this, this new concept of communications protocol system, which, which could be very broadly interpreted. And so I think it is important for people to take a look at that proposal, whatever world you're in, to see whether maybe you're pulled in by it. Um, and then just to one other point that, that Tim made, which is that I do think that we can say, all right, it's not the job of the regulator to tell people that they have to comply with, with the law. The law is there and, and you know if your activity is covered, you should comply with it. But I also think that we shouldn't be so set in our ways that we say, okay, we have one way where we, we have these broad regulatory objectives. For us, it's protecting investors, facilitating capital formation and protecting the integrity of the marketplace. And we, we have these very prescriptive rules about how they, they're they met. And we insist that those rules be adhered to forever and in all time, across, regardless of the changes in technology. That's why we are still picking out from our rule book references to telegrams and, and, and 10 paper copies. Um, we're, we, have to, we have to be able to be forward thinking enough to say, it's the regulatory objectives that matter. It's not the mechanisms of achieving those objectives. And in that, I think we do have to work with people who are innovating and building new products and services, whether it's crypto or blockchain or something totally different and say, okay, if you can work with us and tell us how we can achieve the regulatory objectives, but tweak something so that you can actually do what you want to do, why wouldn't we want to do that? And we do also have to be very careful when it comes to something like DeFi, where it is truly someone putting code out on the internet and saying, if other people, it's open source, other people can use it. We have to be careful of who we're assigning responsibility for activity to, because if it, if it really is 
just a matter of writing code and putting it out there. There are First Amendment implications mm -hmm. of us coming in and saying, we're going to tell you you can't do that. So there are some uniquely challenging things in this space that I think we need to we need to approach it um, quite carefully. Is there, um, if, if, sorry, go ahead, Tim. Well, no, I, I agree a lot with a lot of what uh, Commissioner Purse has said that, you know, the, the agency should be flexible and creative um, in responding, I think, to uh, proposals made by the industry as to how they might comply. I don't think it's the responsibility of the agency to come up with those. As Commissioner Purse herself once said a few years ago, you know, Regulatory sandboxes are, you know, sound okay in concept, but the regulator shouldn't be getting in the sandbox. Um, you know, it's up to the industry to, to figure these things out. Um, but, you know, the, the point is simply that, I mean, if Bernie Madoff, we all agree Bernie Madoff should have gone to jail, right? Well, if Bernie Madoff had designed some sort of autonomous software scheme that perpetuated his Ponzi scheme without him having to do anything once he launched it, you know, it contacted additional investors on automatically and, you know, sent out letters and so forth. We wouldn't say, ah, well, Bernie, you know, there was no centralized entity operating it. So Bernie should, you know, get off. We wouldn't say that. So that's the point. We've got to, you know, hold DeFi to the same standard. I agree. It's a little tricky on exactly what the regulatory nexus is. But I think the industry's got to step up to that responsibility, too. Yeah, um, I, I'd be curious, I, I, I want to again go back to what you said, Hester, about the importance of sort of getting the input from the industry and this collaborative uh, a, a approach so that you also understand what, what the industry is doing. Um, Steve, just, you know, as a member of the industry, as an innovator, you're working at the, at the forefront in your space is, do you feel like there is this space to be heard in the industry and to not opine, but to sort of share, brainstorm on some of these new developments and technologies on DLT and what it can do. How is, I, I know there's a lot of industry groups down in Washington now. I think a lot of them are probably lobbying for particular interests, but there should be some way to have collaboration. Um, what's your view on that? You know, I, I think it's mixed, and I, I think that it, it cut, you know cuts across um, you know lawmakers, uh, regulatory agencies, um, and you know, and, and industry. Um, and you know, I, I think that um, I also think that if you take a step back, you know, these technologies are used for more than one thing. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think your points are you know uh, very good, Tim. But I also think we're seeing. Um, you know, the decentral, uh, decentralized networks used for um, a variety of non-financial applications as well, where transparency is, is very needed. And, and I, I think that, um, you know, it is a little bit of a, a, a complicated situation because people are writing code for lots of different things and using these networks. And I can give an example. Um, I think we're, we're one of the few projects that's seen traction with um, national projects. Um, Columbia deployed their vaccine passport system uh, onto a blockchain network because they were concerned um, that there could be discrimination with people trying to, to get work um, as people returned and questioning whether or not they were actually vaccinated. And they felt by having it be mobile-based, um, having it be blockchain-based where it's transparent and could always be seen, um, you know, truthfully, whether, whether uh, what somebody's status was um, would help avoid some of those conflicts. And today they have about 8 million people um, in their country using uh, using that application. And I think that that's, you know, very interesting use of, of um, of blockchain. And so, uh, you know, we're also seeing other applications. Um, um, one is a project called Planet Watch. They've deployed over 100,000 air quality sensors. It's the largest air quality sensor network in the world. And, and so, you know, they're, they're looking at things like people's health and how that's affected um, by what goes on. And um, they've spun out of, out of CERN because in Europe, um, there are carbon taxes that have to be paid depending on, on pollution. And, and they felt that it wasn't always um, accurately reported back 
um, you know, what was going on with that. And so I think what we're seeing are, you know, kind of new ways to engage people and new ways for people to use the technology. I do think it's very important for there to be freedom for people to experiment um, and build applications and code. And some of them will be financial. And I think that financial applications um, do kind of uh, infer sort of, a, you know, different concerns from a regulatory standpoint, but there's also many non-financial applications and uses of the technology where transparency and decentralization, I think, are becoming um, imperatives, especially we see um, in uh, the developing world where people may not necessarily have, um, you know, as much reason uh, to where they might have concerns about trust um, over governmental agencies that don't exist in America because, um, you know, we have a much more structured system. And so I think we're seeing a lot of different, uh, a lot of different approaches, um, but that, you know, I, I think there are opportunities to, to engage um, in the discussion. And I think that's good. And I, I think one thing from an industry standpoint, and I think you've heard this, whether it's, you know, from Coinbase or exchanges or others is that I, I think largely there's desire um, to both, you know, have clarity and have ways to, to comply, um, but do that in a way that, that doesn't stifle innovation, um, because I do think um, we're at risk of sort of from a long term competitive standpoint, if, you know, if, if sort of Google and Facebook and others were, um, you know, forced to build outside the US, then, you know, largely those companies would be centered outside there. And I, I think that, you know, could become a longer term concern if, if people are building in the US less than they're building elsewhere. Well, yeah, Steve, I totally agree that um, there's a lot of interesting development happening with blockchain uh, and digital assets generally. And I am certainly not looking to try to horn everything into a, a financial regulatory model. Um, and so that does require some, you know, some careful definitions. I, I get worried when I see you know, people saying, well, yes, let's regulate all digital assets in the following way. It's like digital assets is a very broad category. You know, it, it just, frankly, it just reflects the problem we have in the US. Sometimes it's an asset, but in this case, it's a problem of our fragmented regulatory, financial regulatory system, where we have different regulators for particular types of financial instruments. And we don't have a general definition of financial instrument and a regulator who is responsible uh, for overseeing those as new forms emerge. Um, so that's the challenge we face, but you know, you're absolutely right that we shouldn't be uh, expanding the scope of financial regulation to uh, subject these other things. These other things, you know, maybe they uh, fall under the FDA or the Consumer Product Safety Commission, you know, I don't know, but you know, they shouldn't, or the FTC, whatever, uh, but we should, you know, respect, we should, we should, be careful not to expand financial regulation beyond what uh, is necessary. Yeah, I just wanted to add one, one, just a, a couple of other sort of brief things to that, um, or along those that line of thinking. You know, one is, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, climate change and sustainability, and is being an increasing imperative um, across all application developers. And I think one of the things that you know, blockchain technology allows for is, as an example, um, by using online carbon credit marketplaces, um, now um, carbon offsets can be embedded in every transaction that happens automatically so that um, that can just be programmed into um, people's applications. We think that that's uh, going to be incredibly important going forward and, and making sure there's transparency and where those credits came from uh, is important as well. So I think um, we're seeing that. We're also seeing in the creator economy um, really fascinating work going on. So DMC from Run DMC, um, you know, recently launched um, some music where fans can collaborate, own a portion of the music, and they share in kind of the, the economics of it. Uh, and then it sort of uh, helps fans be incented to, to help promote it as well. And so, you know, I think we're seeing different approaches to using the technology, but that largely, um, you know, there are new ways to engage communities uh, and understand what their value is economically. And I think, you know, does that represent um, you know, what does that represent in terms of, you know, kind of regulatory frameworks? I think some of these things are complicated, but I think definitely it's, um, there's a lot of invention happening. Um, and a lot of it is, uh, you know, being done in a way that's positive and engaging and um, helping with things like climate change and sustainability uh, in ways that I think would be very, very difficult to do in, uh, with traditional technology. Esther, did you want to add anything uh, on some of these comments? I mean, I think Steve's point about, about the technology being useful for more than just financial purposes is a good one. And that's why we 
need to be careful about how we're interpreting, you know, our when we look at tokens and we sort of assume that the token is is a security and is going to have to be treated as a security, there's some instances in which that just won't make any sense at all because it it's it's not it doesn't have any link to uh, to the traditional rights or or revenue streams or some, something that would characterize it as a security. So I think we need to be a little more precise in how we're thinking about this space. Um, lest we end up making it very complicated for people to use the technology to do other kinds of things. Right. And I, I think that's such an important message that it's not one size fits all. There's a lot that you can do with this technology and to encourage that and, and, and see what good can come out of it. I'm gonna um, encourage folks to send in questions. We've got a number of questions coming in already. Um, to this point about allowing for innovation and experimentation, one of, one of the question is, is there a way to bring together DeFi and the regulators um, in some sort of safe harbor to facilitate exploration and collaboration, et cetera, within a neutral environment? Esther, I think that's for you. Yeah, I mean, I think that we could try to do that. Again, DeFi is also a broad category. So um, we have mechanisms whereby individual projects can come in and talk to us and can get a no, a, a no action letter, for example, or an exemptive order to do something. And, and that's one way of, of doing, I think, what the, what the question was getting at. Yeah, I would just add, I agree that the no action letter process is a way to do that. And that, that exists. And again, I think if I'm sure that uh, uh, Commissioner Peirce and her colleagues would you know, look at any request uh, that came in uh, seriously in that regard. But you know, again, that initiative needs to be taken, taken by, uh, I think, the people trying to innovate. Unfortunately, that may require uh, a few enforcement actions to point mm -hmm. out that, hey, same activity, same rules apply, and you know, you're held responsible for that um, to motivate people to come up with ideas and to come into uh, the regulatory agencies. Well, I want to push back a little bit on that. I think at the SEC, we have issued a few no action letters in the, in the crypto space. And there's, there have been a couple problems. One, it takes a very long time to get that relief. And so we've got to figure out a way to um, speed up the process. But two, some of the projects that have, have gotten no action relief, you, you read it and you say, well, this wasn't, this didn't have a securities angle anyway. So, so why did they even come in? Or there's so many conditions around this that it, it sort of seems like not much relief, right? And so I think what we need to do, there have been people who have tried to come in and, and get relief, but we need to have something to show for, the, for all that effort. We need to be able to show that, yes, you can actually come in, you can get relief, which will be meaningful relief to allow you to do something um, that you really needed to ask our permission to do. And so I think the process, because it's been broken, and because it takes a long time and, and, and isn't producing those kinds of results, it just, it hasn't gotten the uptake um, that, that we might want it to. And frankly, we probably need to devote more resources internally at the SEC to that kind of work so that we can really um, make, this, make this a productive path. Well, you know, we're kind of getting into the, the devil is, is in the details here. Um, you know, as to exactly how it would work. But look, I'm, I'm all for figuring out other ways for regulators and representatives from the industry who want to try to comply to, you know, discuss these issues and to come up with ideas and maybe to come up with some standards. I mean, you know, a lot of times what happens is you have that kind of conversation and then it leads to a no action letter to kind of confirm uh, what the agency is going to do. And uh, because again, the no action tool is a, is a very useful one uh, that both the SEC and the CFTC have. One question has come in that I think um, 
Commissioner Pertz has perhaps already answered, but it kind of goes around what we're, we're we're talking about a little bit, and that is. Um, Oh my goodness, it looks like, oh, here it is. Is there any possibility for the creation of a regulatory sandbox for DLT in the United States? Now you said you don't, regulators don't climb into sandboxes, but on the other hand, if you're an innovator, it's, I would think, maybe I'm wrong, it's tough to, the no action letters is, it might be hard to be innovating and, you know, coming down that path. So this question um, about a sandbox, I, I don't know, is there any variation on that that's a possibility? Well, I would argue that the no action process is somewhat of a sandbox. We also have exemptive orders that we can issue, which are also kind of a sandbox, which essentially says, look, you know, you can you can comply with with um, our rules. You have to achieve, meet these conditions and then we'll deem you to be sort of in compliance with the rules. That is kind of a sandbox. Um, I think there would be value to trying to come up with some kind of cross-governmental sandbox, mm -hmm. uh, cross-agency sandbox. That would be unique, <laughs> be a new concept, but I think it would help to address one of the concerns, which I think has made people a little hesitant to come in and talk to us. And that is that it's sometimes not clear which regulator right. they should be talking to. So if we could figure out you know, uh, an approach to do something that was cross-agency, I think that would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I would agree that um, exemptive orders and no action letters are kind of the equivalent of a sandbox. I think a lot of jurisdictions who touted their sandboxes do not have those tools. And so a lot of people who, com who have commented on this have not acknowledged or, or understood the difference between how our system works and the broad powers that both the SEC and the CFTC have uh, with respect to the use of their exemptive authority and no action letters. Um, Patricia, if I may, I just wanna know, we've talked for an hour and haven't even talked about the meltdown uh, in one of the biggest DeFi uh, areas that's going on right now, which is with uh, uh, yes. algorithmic stable coins. So well, I don't know if you wanna to get to that. I didn't wanna put anybody at on the spot, there has indeed been uh, a lot of activity uh, one way in the stablecoin market. Uh, I did mention that some of the rumors had said this will in fact force the regulators to come together on stablecoins. Um, before we go to that, Hester, I just wanna say, I think that's a great idea you put out there to have a cross government agency sandbox of sorts because people may not know who to go to. And if that's a possibility, I think you'd have a lot of support in the industry. On the meltdown um, in the stablecoin market, um, I don't know if anybody wants to comment. Uh, I haven't watched it in the last uh, 45 minutes, but um, it was pretty um, active. Uh, Tim, is there anything in particular? No, and I, I just felt like, you know, we shouldn't let the hour go by yeah. without at least noting it. No, I, I think, look, it's it's the meltdown that um, many of us, including myself, kind of feared, uh, particularly with algorithmic stable coins, because they're inherently unstable. The, you know, a stable coin takes in cash, invests it in reserves, and issues the stable coin. In this case, the reserves are another crypto token whose value is tied to the Stablecoin itself. So mm -hmm. you know, when you when you start to go down, you can get into a death spiral. It just points out the need for a regulatory framework. Um, I think that framework actually is outside of the SEC and the CFTC. I think it should be a bank-like framework because these are payment systems. But you know, one that uh, uh, allows for what we might call narrow banks or payment-only mm -hmm. entities. It was indeed tough to cover all the topics that might be affected from a regulatory perspective in this digital market. Uh, we are indeed running out of time. Um, before we close, are there any final remarks folks would like to make? Um, I don't know if, uh, Steve, from your perspective, you're obviously in this market for better or for worse, or your company is very involved. Is there anything, uh, you've heard a few ideas about regulatory um, thinking. I don't know if you have any thoughts. For sure. Well, um, first of all, you know, I, I, I think one thing is it's great that that I think this is getting serious consideration um, from you know regulators and lawmakers and elsewhere. And you know, I'm confident that that uh, a good answer will be come to. I, I also think I would just um, sort of leave people with 
Um, you know, if, if people think back to kind of the early days of the internet in 2001, you know, the market, uh, you know, was uh, was sort of down, um, but I think, you know, user adoption was up very quickly. And if you look over those intervening years, um, that's when a lot of, you know, really interesting uses of the technology were going on. And I think, you know, what we're seeing right now is, you know, very kind of rapid adoption in terms of users uh, all over the world starting to interact with blockchain applications. Um, and I think irrespective of what the markets are doing, I think the applications of the technology and the use of these networks is gonna to continue to grow um, very quickly over, over the next several years. And so, um, you know, I think we've never been more excited about, you know, the adoption and what we see going on out there. And um, I think it's gonna be a, an, an interesting time for sure. Great. Well, I'm getting nudged here that uh, we are about to uh, to lose our, our, our place. We've come to a close. Uh, I, I just want to say that um, thank you so much for both your time and your thoughts. I think this has been a great conversation. It's a tough topic. Uh, there's no easy solutions, but sharing our ideas, I think, has been really wonderful. So thanks to all three of you uh, as speakers. It's also time to close the symposium. I don't want to say we saved the best for last, but I think it was a very good conversation. Um, and I just want to say to our guests also for participating, thank you very much. We're delighted to say, <clears throat> I think the numbers are we've had more than 120 central banks and over 2,000 participants um, during this conference and of, from over 140 countries. So there has indeed been an awful lot of interest. And we also want to thank those whose contributions helped make um, the program possible. I think without a doubt, we can say the intersection of digital assets and DeFi technology and innovation and regulation will be at the heart of the future of money. And as we look to continuing to engage in that revolution through our public and private discourse, such as we have today. So thank you very much for being part of that discourse over these past two days. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.